you have to understand that like this bike is is special to me. Not that like it's like you know the only thing I have that's special to me, but this bike is special to me. And uh, I used to have a yellow mountain bike that I would bring to Coburg, and it just so happened that one year one of the young men uh, in our youth group said. Pastor Jay, can I borrow your bike for like five minutes? Now you see, the first time anybody tells you when they give you a time limit, you know something's gonna happen. <laughs> so, did my bike come back the same way I gave it out? Are you kidding me? The bike came back, the front, the front wheel was busted, the forks were bent, and he says, I don't know what happened. That was my problem because when he said five minutes, I should have known better. So when I got my new green bike, no one rode my bike. And I get, oh, you're so mean. Call me whatever you want to call me. You're not touching my bike. So I just wanted to say my wonderful friend, Memphis. And by the way, he's wearing a Memphis sweatshirt because he dared not put on a Bulls uh, jersey t-shirt because I don't want to mention that some player like busted his other knee. Uh, they're gross. Um, and, uh, and so, don't leave, don't leave. Come back, come back, come back. I will be okay next year. <laughs> uh, I love him. I mean, you know, on his Facebook page, he's like, Derek Rose, Derek Rose. And he should have had, like, hospital beside his name. Okay. <laughs> anyway, that's really bad. Anyway. I am so glad to be here tonight. I, um, I just want to say thank you so much today for inviting me. In fact, I remember when he called and a couple months ago when we started talking about this, and, uh, and then he just started talking about his, the dream and the vision for this weekend. Uh, it really uh, was exciting to hear his heart. And sometimes you don't know the story behind the back page of, of, of something. And uh, if two years ago, if you were involved in some of the conversations that we had, uh, you'd be not thinking that today would happen. But when I walked here tonight, walked in tonight, and I saw this this church and I, I like I'm excited for you. I'm, I I walked in and he's showing me around and and when I think of what two years ago looked like to what it looks like now, all I can say is God is good and God opens up the evil doors and, and it's, it's not even one of those moments where you sit there and go, did God do this? You have to say that only God could have done this go downstairs and there's hardwood floor and you know God is with you when there's a ping pong table and a pool table that they threw in. I mean like that's a good thing. I mean no, okay, don't be like somebody like, what? Is that in the Bible? Relax. It's just, you know. But it, I mean it's just an amazing thing. So I just want to thank you for inviting me uh, here this uh, this uh, weekend and to, uh, to spend time with you. And uh, I'm, this is the first time I've ever digital, like, gone digital with uh, like my Bible. Like I, I, I mean tomorrow I'm gonna have my Bible, but today I decided I'm gonna try this. Like, and I never actually like like when I'm sitting, I, I use this in church when I'm in church and stuff. Although there was one Sunday morning I was in church, and uh, I was I have a note thing, so you could write notes. <laughs> this lady after service comes up to me and goes, "No, it's not good to text while you're in church." <laughs> and I so like I had about 14 answers, you know, I wanted to give her, and I said, "Well, no, I was writing notes, but you know, it's not good to text." So I said, no, no, I was writing notes, but you know it's not good to text. So you know it's over, eh? So I said, you know what? I will not text again in your presence. This is an incredible opportunity for change. And uh, this weekend is amazing. I don't think, uh, sometimes, you know, we think we need forever. Uh, sometimes we don't need, we think that, well, you know, how, how are things going to change in our lives? Wow, now I can run up and down the aisles. This is going to be awesome. Uh, I won't. Uh, sometimes we think we need three years, three months, three weeks for change, but you know, change can come in less than 24 hours when God is in it. And uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, by the way, whatever you have to do, uh, I want to encourage you to come back. Um, I know there's other people who are going to be joining us, but, uh, but you know, if you have to break the date with the girl with four bad fingernails and like, you know, one eye, or, you know, maybe you had a date with like, you know, the guy with bad breath, you know that he's going to curl your hair when he breathes on you anyway, so you might as well just show up here. 
So forget, just break that date. You just need to come back tomorrow. And you're wondering, how did you know that I was going out with that guy? Anyway, um, but we want to encourage you to come back tomorrow. It's going to be a full day starting at 11. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to speak on the subject, when the shout doesn't matter. I'm going to talk about unity. And I believe that God has given us a, a, a now word for, for you. And I believe that God will bless our hearts. And um, I believe that tonight God wants to bless our hearts. And tonight I want to talk to you about the subject changing postal codes. Changing postal codes. And I believe that, that there's something here for all of us. So um, if you have your Bibles, I want, to turn you, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 18. I put it up on the screen as well because sometimes we don't have our Bibles. Sometimes we don't have our electronic Bibles or our other Bibles. Um, and by the way, you know, God, sometimes we look at things the, the wrong way. One of my mentors, uh, Roosevelt Hunter, who's passed on and gone to be with the Lord, and I miss him dearly. Uh, one day we had an, uh, a big conversation. We were on the beach in Tampa, and I was talking about how uh, sometimes I get upset because you watch the P. Diddy's of this world do the things that they do. And he said to me that God is a, a God of creativity, and he's given us all creativity moments. And some of the people are using it for bad. Why don't we use it for good? And so um, I think that God has inspired people to do incredible things. And I think that, you know, sometimes when we say, oh, you know what, I, I don't want to bring my Bible because it's too big or, you know, like, oh, people think you can even have it on your phone now. So, like, there's no excuse for us not to have the Word of God in our hearts. But, um, but tonight I, I, want, I, want to, I want to get into this. So uh, we're going to start in Luke 18. And uh, we're going to start in verse 18 through 25 uh, and continue on. And then uh, we'll just keep going and see where God takes it. Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not <coughs> excuse me, testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. The man replied, I have obeyed all these commands since I was young. Verse 22. When Jesus heard his answer, he said, There's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was rich, very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to go enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if we go one chapter further, we're going to read Luke chapter 19 and the first 10 verses. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. And that's a message right there, but that's for another day. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come, quickly come, quickly come down, excuse me. I must be a guest in your house today, verse 6. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house with great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He is gone to be, uh, he's gone to the home of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I cheated people on their taxes, cute, he probably did, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who were lost. So Father, tonight, we thank you for this conference called Kingdom Fire. And Lord, it's amazing what you can do with the beginnings of something unbelievable that you've inspired in the hearts of men. And so God, tonight I pray that as we embark on this uh, time together and we talk about changing postal codes, that you would, by your presence, by your spirit, speak clearly and definitive to each one of us. Lord, may true fire come from above and purify what needs to be purified. 
adjust what needs to be adjusted, change what needs to be changed, and that, Lord, we would not hold back on you because, Lord, you never held back on us. So we thank you for your goodness, and we bless you for what you're about to do. And everybody say, Amen. 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 Have you ever moved into a new neighborhood and you didn't know what you were about to expect? Uh, or maybe you're friends, maybe you've never moved. Um, I remember when I moved uh, about eight blocks to another area of Lachine, and the first thing that I wish somebody told me about was the stupid alley cat that I was going to encounter a lot. And you might be saying, oh, I like cats. Listen, an alley cat is different from a normal cat. Keep your cat in your house, and that's a good thing. But alley cats drive me crazy. No one told me that there'd be a lot of summer nights where I'd have to close my window because Mr. Alley Cat would get into a fight with another alley cat. And they're just not quiet about it. I remember when it's 2.30. You know, they should have had a cattle product to use with that alley cat. That's a perfect time. You know? <laughs> I said that once and somebody said, you're going to kill a cat with like a cattle product? No, I, I just mentioned it. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to kill one. I'd like to, but anyway. 2.30 in the morning, I've got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, I, I get startled at this. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. So I turn on my side light outside. And there's these three cats having a hoedown fight. I mean, little, like, go, knock it out, go and create. Nobody told me that when I changed the postal code, that was going to happen. Or, um, one of my favorite uh, stories is uh, this kid came up to me out of camp and said, you know, one of the things I hate about my new neighborhood, there's no McDonald's near my house. And he actually said to me, he goes, it's two buses away. And this guy, I said to him, I go, you know, it's not a bad thing because McDonald's is not exactly like the best. You, ever you don't understand they have the best fries. Did you know that McDonald's fries hardly has any potatoes in them? <laughs> I just found this out. I mean, I used to like McDonald's fries. And maybe that's the reason why I don't eat them so much anymore. But like, they have more potato starch than potatoes. And the 13 other ingredients when it should be just a potato. Oh, okay, that's just thought I mentioned that. And some of you are going to McDonald's later going, well, go to Wendy's because they have real fries. Or Five Guys. Five Guys rocks. I just thought I'd throw that in. Okay, Five Guys is not paying me. I don't get a shirt. And their shirts are not even that nice anyway. It just says Five Guys. But anyway, okay, this is another story. You know what I really hate about like changing postcode? It's the, no it's the nosy neighborhood lady. Sticks her nose in. There was this lady that lived in the back of our house. And she would always, as my brother and I were growing up, would always come up and say, Mrs. Mills, I saw your sons out on the street today. Now, the reality was we were just walking in the street, but she'd always have something to say. Or one time we got in trouble because my brother and I, we loved to play baseball when we were growing up, and we'd just find any space. We'd find it on the street, we'd find it on the curb, we would just throw the ball around. And one day, we were playing, and admittedly, like we were, like, we used to try to like see how close we could get to the buses, you know? So we're throwing the baseball and you're trying to see how close you can get. And of course, when my mom came home from work, she comes over and she goes, Mrs. Mills, Keith and Dave were outside today, I mean, obviously, and they were throwing the baseball near the bus. Almost hit the bus. Well, when my father came home, his hand met a couple of areas on my body that hurt. So that nosy neighborhood lady was not a friend of mine. I did not like her. But things happen when you change neighborhoods, change postal codes. There are environmental changes that take place every time we move. When we move from elementary school to high school, or from high school to Sija, there are changes that are taking place. And we're subject to dealing with all those changes. We get a new job, whether it be part-time or full-time. We make new friends or relationship. There are postal code changes that are not just a physical move, but they're emotional, physiological, psychological, postal code changes that we all have to contend with. Our society is an environmental postal code change happening all the time. We're being challenged constantly and continually to shift and change, and sometimes we don't even notice how slowly we are being postal code changed out of our belief systems, how we are supposed to think or act. 
Which leads us to these incredible accounts in this story. So, so in Luke 18, uh, before we get to the rich man, uh, Jesus has just told the story about the persistent widow who had been driving the judge crazy to get justice or something that had happened to her. And Jesus was pointing out how persistent we needed to be when we're asking God to answer our heart's cries. And sometimes I wonder if, you know, as time goes on, are we persistent enough to not give up when things don't go our way? And then he tells the story about the holier than now religious man who goes up to, uh, you know, to church to pray and, and he wants everybody to know how holy he is and he's so much better than everybody else and, you know, I just, I thank God that I'm better than everybody else. And then Jesus transposes the story and talks about the, the tax collector that comes up and, and he, he's asking for mercy. And the Bible says that the second man went home right because of his attitude. Do sometimes do we have a bad attitude? And you know, sometimes a bad attitude doesn't just show up like outwardly. Sometimes we have it on the inside, which is just as dangerous as on the outside. And, and then the, the third thing that we see is Jesus is blessing little children. And, and the disciples are saying, stay away, kids. Man, they must have been that bad uncle you just didn't want. Eh? You know, until the disciples got themselves together after the resurrection. Can you imagine that here it is, Jesus, you know, the kids are excited about Jesus and here come, you know, Get away, you know, they must be just ugly guys at times, eh? Get away, move away. But Jesus says, no, bring them to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to these children. And he says something very profound, that to get in the kingdom, we have to have the faith of a child. Not childish faith, but childlike faith. So now this rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And, and the Bible doesn't say exactly if he was standing by and he witnessed the pre previous conversations and all, interactions. But it appears that he was close enough and waiting for his chance to speak. And this man wanted a change in his life, but he wanted it his way. I mean, it says he kept all the commandments, he did good things, uh, he did a lot of great things, but then when Jesus says, give your money to the poor and follow me, what is it about us that says, I want to take God on my own terms because I want my cake and eat it too? I mean, I'm a good person, I do good things, but when will we ever know how much good we've done against the mistakes, the errors, the sins, the omissions, the missing of God's mark that we will need to account for to make sure that we have enough good points to balance it off? I, I mean, this young man, he had it all. He was rich, he was cool, he was smart, he was elite. Uh, he, he could have been a private school kid. Uh, he probably played basketball or football or soccer, and he wasn't Derrick Rose. Um, sorry, he's not here yet, but I, just, I, I keep looking for him. I want him to come back. Tell him I love him, okay? Uh, he was probably at the top. Oh, there you are. Oh, hey! Derek's friend, okay. Um, he was probably at the top of the class. He probably did things better than anybody else. But he was missing a key element in the spiritual postal code change. And that is your spiritual environment on the inside has to change for it to be true change. If the inside doesn't change, it doesn't matter when the change comes on the outside. In fact, tomorrow I will mention a couple things about a conference I was at on Monday. And it was called We Day. And uh, there's 2,000 young people from across uh, Quebec who came, high school students and, and even some elementary students, and they're talking about environmental change and feeding children and, and making a change. And, and it's all great, and there's so many good things that are being done. But you know what? If you're missing the inside spiritual change, you're still missing. That's why it's a mess in our society today that we have music and movie stars dictating the way that things should be when they're messed up on the inside. Just because they might have a postal code that we might like. They might be, have a lot of money. They may have a lot of fame. They have a lot of fanatics who think they're cool. But just because they are cool does not mean they are in the right postal code and they're dangerous. And for a lot of people, we think they're cool. We think that they know something that we don't. And sometimes we'll actually consider walking into their postal code area or actually in it and not realizing that they're in a place that is dangerous, that's causing them to be bankrupt, and we can go bankrupt too. So, so we leave this rich young ruler, and the crazy thing is you never hear about the rich young ruler again, ever in scripture. And the last thing that you hear about him is he walks away sad. 
Can you imagine what it must be that you're in the presence of Jesus, who is offering you an opportunity to go hang with him, and you, you walk away sad because you realize that you just can't give up what you think you need to have. And the Bible says you never hear about this man again, and he leaves sad. And now we have this other scene. Zacchaeus, he's a tax collector and he's hated. Uh, tax collectors were some of the most despised people during that time. Why? It's because most of them were Jews, but they chose to work for Rome. And because they chose to work for Rome, they were collecting from the Jews. Not only did they collect, but they were notorious gougers. They used to rip off their own people. And it was unbelievable how how much, like, I, I remember reading this story, I don't know how many times, and it never dawned on me until the last little while I was uh, studying for this night, I realized just how much he must have been despised because of the way they talked about him later. Um, he's a bad guy, a dude, he's living in a bad postal code, but then he hears that Jesus is coming, and, uh, you know, it's funny, here it is, this man that is living a crazy life, he's living the way he wants to live, but he hears Jesus is going to pass by, and he decides he's got to see him. So he's got a couple of attractions going for him. Everybody hates him, he's short, um, and you know, he's got, he's got to do something. So the crowds are swelling, and, and they're excited to see Jesus, and Jesus looks up and beelines for Zacchaeus. Now, yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, Jesus knew that Zacchaeus was there. I don't know about you, but I wish I was there. Could you imagine? Here, I'm excited to see Jesus, and I know that I'm, I'm trying to, you know, do the right thing, and I'm trying to live by the by the by the law, uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments. I'm trying to live a right life, and there's this like you know little piss weak little jerk of a guy who's been ripping off to everybody in the town, and he gets up into a tree, and Jesus goes right to him. Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I gotta come to your house today. I don't know about you, but if you're not a liar like I am, I've been ticked off. Man, what's your problem, Jesus? Look at that guy. He's a chum. And you're gonna go to his house. Are you crazy? But that's exactly what happens. And for those of you who have had a relationship with Jesus, and it's not like it should be because you've stepped out of the right postal code, or maybe you might even be here tonight, I don't know, and you didn't know until tonight that Jesus was looking for you, you need to pay attention to this little moment here because Jesus speaks to our hearts through this story and says that I will come anywhere to find you. The question is, will you be listening and will you pay attention to what he's trying to tell you? And now this man is excited. So here's a bad guy. He's a short guy and he's a bad guy. What a combination. Okay, he's a short guy he's, and I don't, uh, hey, like I'm only 5'10", so like, you know, my brother's 6'4", so sometimes people say to me, you know, don't you wish you were like your brother? You know, that hurts. And I, and I go, well, okay, like, I, I look half handsome. Oh, by the way, for November, I, like, I, I never worn a goatee before, so I, I'm trying to like change the image a little bit. You, you have a really good, thick growth there, but I, uh, not me. But, I, I mean, is it okay? Do you think it's not bad? Like, you know, don't, don't clap, but like, you know, if you think it's okay, it's not that good. All right. I just thought I'd mention it. So, Jesus comes into this postal code of this man Zacchaeus, and not only does he come to town, but he goes after the worst guy, the outcast, the mythos. But not only that, Jesus also comes to the cool people, the cool dudes, the dudesses. He comes to anybody, and he wants to hang out with us. The change is dramatic because Zacchaeus not only just wants to give back, but he wants to give back more because the love of Jesus has warmed his heart to believe that an inside postal code change, an inside spiritual change, is what he needed. And he needed it more than having like the look or the fret. And sometimes even for us as Christians, those that call ourselves Christ in me believers, sometimes we have a friend. Sometimes we make it seem like everything is so cool. And sometimes the reason why is because we don't want anybody to judge us. Because sometimes we can be the worst judges too. Even though we're not supposed to judge like we judge, we do sometimes an awful job of it. And sometimes we have to put up a friend or we want or we feel like we have to. But the reality is when Jesus comes to us, 
we can't put up a front because the longer we put up a front, it's just the longer before we get healed from whatever it is that's holding us back. So there's three takeaways for Apostle Code Change. And the first thing is, your thinking, my thinking, must change. Proverbs 23, 7 says, what he, a young man or woman, thinks is what he really is. Everything starts with a thought. God thought the world and it came into being. How many young men, how many young women, wish that they could have come back from what they were thinking and stop whatever they were about to do because it wrecked their life. All because of a thought. You are today where your thoughts have brought you and you will be tomorrow where your thoughts are gonna take you. Your mind and my mind is fertile ground. The reason why I'm careful about what I let into my eye gates is because I know how fertile and how quick my mind moves. I know because of my past instances from, from when I dealt with pornography, I know I must be careful with what I do and what I watch. There are shows that I don't watch, not because they're the worst shows in the world, and not because I think I'm a prude, it's just because I've decided that my mind is so quick and so active and so fertile, I have to guard my mind. And a lot of times we just don't, we don't realize how fertile our mind is. What you think you eventually become. And I believe that in our society we've lost the ability to think. Do you realize in the last 300 years the changes that have happened in terms of automation? I mean, 300 years ago there was nothing called polyester. And you may not like polyester, but polyester is something that has saved a lot of people and it's been very, very cheap. But there was nothing like that. There were no cars 300 years ago. There was no uh, planes 300 years ago. But God gave people thoughts. And people took those thoughts and ran with them. There's George Washington Carver, who took a peanut and developed 300 uses for a peanut. He also decided that there had to be something more than just picking cotton. And so they started doing crop rota rotations down in the southern states. And they've been able to continue growth because there, at a certain point there's not going to be that much cotton left. The Wright brothers. I can just imagine when they said, hey, we're going to go make something that looks like a plane. We're going to go fly it. I think a lot of people thought they needed to go to the loony bin. Because who, nobody ever saw a plane. But it was a thought. It was something that came up in their minds and they decided to run with it. God didn't make steel or wood to make a house or a structure. But he gave us the natural elements and he said, do something with this. And evolutionists will try to make you think and make Christians think that we can't and we don't think. Well, who do you think put the stars in place? The natural order of life. I don't like Dr. Oz. Why? It's because there's too many times where he shows pictures and it's like inside and it's gory. And I don't like that. I don't like blood. I don't want to be a doctor. You know, like when they come and kneel, they I get a needle for something. I just look away and I go, oh, it's coming. I don't want to know. Just do it. I don't want to. Don't tell me. Just do it. I don't want to see the blood, I don't care, I don't want to know. My wife goes, oh, look at that, they're showing how they pull this back, and like, she's just like, see it, so high. I'm sorry, like, you know, just like move on to like, how you're going to catch the killer. I don't want to know about how, you know, they rip the body back, and you see all that. Having said that, you can't tell me that it was not a thought that put our bodies back, bodies together. You can't tell me that we just popped up and happened. When you think about the ingenious design, it had to be a thought. And a thought produced something called a human being. It was a thought. It wasn't just an action. It wasn't just a, a wishful thinking. It just wasn't like, you know, boop, just came out of nowhere. Only a thinking, loving, progressive God could have designed the human body. So when someone tells me that I must have checked my brains at the door for being a Jesus scholar, they haven't paid much attention to who and what they're talking about because the God I serve is not only loving, he's not only the God of justice, he's not only the God of a second chance, not only the God who sent his only son Jesus for me and you so that we can live, he is a thinking God. There's been this dumbing down of the society. We don't think any longer. TV reality shows. You know, there are people who have studied the arts and music, and they're looking for jobs. 
and we have yeah, here comes Honey Boo Boo on the bottom, you know. And then we have like, you know, Nene and Chualisha. And you know, the only reason why they're on TV is because they look good. They haven't given anything to the society, like we've done things down. You know, everything is done down and we're losing our whole progression in society. We're wasting our minds and time because our thoughts are messed up. It's amazing working in high school, talking to young people, and it's amazing how you can see that they're not thinking. I was telling some of the, some of the singers tonight before the service that um, there's this one guy who's been suspended three or four times, he's come back, and one of his problems is he just doesn't work hard. Sometimes, if at all, so he's always getting someone like you know they're yeah we're yakking in his ear. So I said to him, "Why do you think that like that's okay that you need to have people yakking at you all the time?" He goes, "Oh, this school sucks. Why does this school suck? You make me go to study hall. Well, you're failing. Maybe you need to go to study hall. Oh, this school sucks. You're always giving me detention. Well, if you get into trouble, that's probably what's going to happen. This school sucks. Why does this school suck?" Oh, because you're making me do things I don't want to do. Oh, do you have a life right now? Oh, you don't have a life right now. You're gaining a life. Oh, that's right. You don't know anything, and your parents are paying for everything. And uh, everything that's on your body is done by your parents, because you're still trying to figure it out. But yeah, we're stupid. Yeah, yeah okay, we're stupid. And we've got this dumbing down because we're not thinking, and yet we serve a God who's a thinking God. When someone tells me, oh, you know, you're just emotional, let me tell you something. I may be emotional, but my brain works and it thinks, and it's because of the God that I serve that helps me to think, and it helps me to be progressive because he's a progressive thinking God. Why are our thoughts like they are? Is because sometimes we are not thinking progressively. That's why we need the word of God because it will help clean up our messed up minds and help us get it together. You may have heard this before. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Why do you and I need to think properly is because sooner or later, what we think will produce character out of us. Why is it that so many people, even believers, mess up? Is because somewhere along the line, the thinking got messed up. Somewhere along the line, something got lost in translation. And we make some errors and mistakes and things that we would never ever have dreamed that we could ever have done. Why? It's because something happened in the thinking progression to get us the character. And God doesn't want us to be messing up because we have a world to live in that is messed up and they need to see something that's clear and makes sense. And it doesn't make us holier than thou, it just makes us people living under the umbrella, under the coverage of God, who is a thinking progressive God, and we need Him to help us. So we need to really make sure that our thinking changes with God's help. The second takeaway is the why matters. Our life position is on the hook. John 10.10 10 says that these purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy but his purpose, speaking of Jesus, is to give life in all its fullness. The reason why so many people in our society are, are, lose, are like Christians, I'm speaking of, are like falling by the wayside, is because we don't understand that our life's position, the why, this matters so much. That's why it's important that you consider what you do. Um, I remember I was... Uh, a long time ago. I know that I look young, but I am a few years older than you think. Um, some kid the other day said to me, Sir, how old are you? I said, 52. <gasps> are you going to retire? <laughs> you know, there's moments when you just want to slap a kid at, you know, like, bam, you know, like, shut up. <laughs> but I didn't slap him. I just looked at him and said, you know what? I'm leaving now. <laughs> I went for a coffee and a chair towel. Okay, anyway. Um, I was 18, I was working downtown one Saturday, and a bunch of us from church were supposed to go out after, uh, after uh, you know, everybody working or doing whatever, and we are going to go to movies. 
So we're supposed to meet at Guy Concordia, Guy Concordia. It wasn't called Guy Concordia at the time, it was just called Guy, Guy, whatever you want to call it. That shows you how long ago it was, okay? And so anyway, um, I, get to the, I get to the metro station and I'm waiting. And it's now 6.30, we're supposed to meet at 6. 6.45, Brent shows up. And I go, Brent, where's everybody? He goes, um, well, things have changed. Plans have changed. And I go, well, like, well, what's going on? And he says, well, we're, uh, we're like, we're, we're, we're going to go hang out somewhere else. I go, where did everybody else go? Oh, they changed their mind. Okay. So he goes, then he says to me these words, and I'll never forget. He goes, you don't know what the people are really like. And we're talking about young people. You don't know what they're like on the weekend. And then they show up on Sunday. And, uh, he, and as we're walking, he goes, I'm going to prove it to you tonight. And so, uh, like, I'm kind of like, well, what are you talking about? He says to me, we're going, we're going to walk, and we went uh, a couple streets over, I think it was uh, Mountain Street, and just above Mountain in the music, there was, this, there was this club. And as we're walking, he's, he said, oh, I, I could see him even now when he goes, yeah, you know, Sunday morning, he was like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. And on Friday and Saturday, they're, yeah. And he's doing this, and they're walking up the street. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm getting it on, you know, and, like, and I'm like, looking at him, like, no, no, I don't, you know, I still don't believe this type of thing. And I'm not saying I'm, you know, like, I'm not talking like, oh, you know, I'm being a crude here. I'm just saying, like, I, I don't get this. Go up these stairs. And you know that he's been there before because as we're going up the stairs, I saw three of the biggest monkey security guys I've ever seen in my life. I mean, these guys were monsters. And they all, hey, Brent, what's going on? As we're walking up the stairs, I see a drug deal happening in front of me. And then I see a guy and a girl walking to the washroom. And they didn't go into, like, you know, they didn't go like this. They went like that. And I'm like, going, wow. So then I know he's been there before because they go, oh, you can go in and your friend can go in too. And they stared at me, like, really hard. Like, you know, like, it was one of those two things. One, you don't belong here. Or two, why are you here? Type of thing, you know. And I'm just like, Jesus, please don't let me die. <laughs> I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> Turned the corner, and I saw eight of my friends, eight of the 20 that were supposed to go to this movie tonight. They're out on the floor going crazy. And some of the things I saw there, I couldn't believe. And again, I'm not throwing dirt or not throwing stones or anything. I remember walking back to the Atwater Metro, like I was in there like maybe six, seven minutes, I guess. And for about an hour and a half, I didn't even get on the bus. I just was like sitting there going, okay, what, what am I missing here? Because like I just, and true to form, on the next day, Sunday morning, some of my friends are like, Jesus! Oh, Jesus! The Holy Ghost said, Oh, And you know, if you get, you know, and like, and I'm thinking, you were doing this on Saturday morning. And I think it was about then that I realized the context of how the enemy will come to kill, steal, and destroy. And it won't come like with a sledgehammer to our heads. It'll be tricks, schemes, and all sorts of like little little things to try to throw us off. And so sometimes we go, well, why do I need to think? Well, the why is important because our life is on the clock, our life's position, our testimony is on the clock. And it's not about being approved. There's just things I won't do anymore. Not because I think I'm better than anybody else, because I know that it'll destroy me eventually if I keep doing the same things that everybody else does. It doesn't make sense after a while. Does it make sense that I, I would go to a, a, a party at work and I would get drunk, blasted out of my mind, and try to get in my car to drive, which I've seen many times when I've worked in schools and other places. Does it make sense that I will be in positions where I will try to like, you know, jump out on my way and do something stupid just because there was a moment that could have happened? Does it make sense that I'm putting and allowing things to get into my mind, to infiltrate it, to cause me to do things that I would never dream of doing? And so the why really matters. It's not only about thinking, but you gotta know why. And the why is that someone's trying to kill, steal, and destroy you and I. Not only that, take it a step further, trying to destroy our testimony. Because you know it's hard to get back after you've blown your testimony. And not because God can't restore, redeem, and revive. But the reality is, is that there's some things that are harder to come back from than other things. And it's not just about what God thinks about it, because if God loves
loves us. He, uh, the first time we ask him to forgive us, you know, he forgives us and he washes us clean and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible declares and that's the truth of, about the matter. But let's take it a step further. Those around us, especially when we're talking the context of people who are not, uh, they're, they're, they're seekers, that if they know of us like this, and we do a lot of dumb things over here, it's hard for them to believe in the Jesus we talk about when we keep when we keep blowing it and doing things that are unbelievable and they go contrary to what God says. And yes, you know, like we do dumb things. We, you know, we lose our temper and blah, blah, blah. But there are points where there's some things that are just different from others. I mean, uh, I'm going I'm to tell you, tell you this story. It's, uh, it's, it's, I'm not proud of it, but it's just funny in the sense of like, how I realized how God protected me because I could have been really stupid. I'm um, working at the Westmont High School. I'm on a business trip for a week in Boston. I'm dating this girl who, you know, from you know, loves God, and, and that's another story. Eh? Sometimes you know, people say, "Oh, you know, go with her because she loves, she or he loves God." Well, a lot of people love God, but that doesn't mean anything, you know. I, I hate that one. Eh? Oh, they love God. Okay, well, you know. All right. You know, she might have four eyes, but hey, she loves God. You know? <laughs> we can talk more about four eyes another time. So I come back. It's Sunday night. It's eight thirty. I've been out for a week. I'm tired, and so my ex girlfriend she goes, "Hi, how are you?" I'm tired. Oh, well, why'd you come over? I'm house sitting. No, no. And right away, I can hear the bells ringing. No, don't go over. Oh, come on. Just come for a little while. I haven't seen you for a week. No, I better not. She goes, I think you better come over. Just come for a half an hour, please. No, I'm gonna, no, I'm not going to come over to you. I know. Okay. And you know when you get those okays, eh? you're like, okay, like you've killed somebody. And uh, she goes, okay, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow. So I get off the phone and I'm like, going, okay, smart thing. Ten minutes later, the phone rings again. Are you sure you don't want to come over for a little bit? I'll make chocolate chip cookies and hot chocolate. Okay, I'm coming for 15 minutes, but then after I'm going to go home. The whole way I'm driving over, the bells are ringing. I mean, like, you know, Christmas bells are ringing. Well, the bells of heaven are going... Calling me dummy, I'm just like adding the word, but I mean, it's like, go home, get out of the car. I'm going up these stairs, and I can hear the bells ringing like it's even louder. Remember, I said I was coming for hot chocolate and chocolate chip cookies, correct? Well, the door opens, there's 36 scented candles, romantic music, and I don't see any chocolate chip cookies inside. <laughs> And I remember, I'll never forget, looking when are the chocolate chip cookies in the kitchen? <laughs> and I rolled into the kitchen. Now, I don't blame her because I didn't have to go. But I remember that, and, and thank God, nothing much happened. And at a certain point, she was so mad because she had other plans. And I left. And I remember feeling so guilty for a while. And I, and I, I, could, re I could hear God speaking to me later on saying, you know, I was ringing the bell. I was ringing the bell. And later on she told me, because of the messed up situation she'd been living in, she wanted to be the one to say that like, I got Dave Mills in bed. That was what she wanted to do. And again, not blaming her because it was my fault. But I remember after that saying, God, it will never ever happen again where I will put myself in that type of position where I could in a moment kill, steal, destroy. It's too important for us to sit there and go, why? Why does our thinking have to change? Why do we have to be in the right postal code area, spiritually speaking? We need to understand that the life that God wants to give us is fullness. On the other hand, we have somebody else who's coming after us real hard and he wants to knock us out. So how do you want to play the game? And then the third thing is the fear of change. But if the rich young man only knew that in John 6, 63 says, it is the spirit or breath who gives eternal life. 
Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to are spirit and life. And in the original Greek, spirit literally means breath. So Jesus is telling us that his words, the messages that he came to deliver are not normal words. He's basically saying, these words I've spoken to are breath. It's a blast of wind to give you life. Or putting another word away, my words are fresh air for you. It can transform the way you live and help you figure out what's from God and what's not. And he wants to give us fresh breath. I, I say a lot of times when, you know, people are off, I say, breathe. And sometimes people don't understand, like, the depth of it, because they go, well, of course you have to breathe, because if you don't breathe, you're going to die. Well, obviously, you know, boy, you're a genius. But, but the reality is, is that sometimes we don't realize that God wants to breathe deeper than just normal breath. He wants to breathe spiritual breath into us. And so it's not only just about the change thinking-wise, it's not just about the why that matters, it's also to know that maybe fear has kept us back from totally engaging God to the point where we can be free to breathe. There's so many people who don't breathe. They don't breathe, they're, they're sucking air because life is sucking the very life out of them. Do you know there's nothing too difficult, nothing too painful, nothing too embarrassing, nothing too human or too earthy that a Jesus postal code change can't address? Jesus called, interesting in this story, Jesus called Zacchaeus, now a son of Abraham, for what he did when he said he was going to return all the money. And it meant for a lot of things. For the religious people, they were ticked off. Because number one, they're going, this corrupt guy is like us. This little short, little shrimp of a guy who's been gouging us and taking our money, and you call him a son of Abraham? Abraham being the forefather of the of, of Israel? And, and, and they're upset. Also, the other thing is, they would have not wished to admit it that the sons of Abraham could be lost. A lot of times religious people like to think that you know, hey, we've got it all together and no one can touch us. But the reality is, is that if you don't have a heart change, a thought change, you can get lost just as anybody else. We're not saved because of a good heritage or condemned by a bad one. It's faith that Jesus came to save spiritually bankrupt postal code people, no matter what their background or previous way of life. So if you're here tonight and you need a postal chip, a code change, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God and it's by confessing with your mouth that you're saved. And the Bible says that anyone who believes in him will not be disappointed. The majority of us are in the second part. We're in the right postal code, but sometimes we're a little off. And in Revelation 3.20, Jesus is talking to the churches. And when I was a kid, I didn't understand because my just my understanding wasn't there. And I thought Jesus was talking to people who were not believers when you read this scripture. But as I got older, I understood that Jesus was talking to the church when he said, Hey, I'm standing here at the door and I'm knocking. If you hear me calling, open the door and open the door. I will come in and we'll share a meal as friends. And I'm going to invite everyone who's victorious to sit with me on the throne. And the end of the verse says... He who's willing to hear should listen to the Spirit and understand what Spirit breath, Spirit breath is trying to say, trying to say to us. So here's Jesus saying to us, you know, you might be having a few rough moments. That's okay. It's what you do with the moments from the point that you understand you're having a, a rough moment to get to the next level, to get to the next moment. That's what happens to so many people. We don't go to the next point. And Jesus is saying, hey, I want to hang out with you. How many times have we ever just kind of like, yeah, Jesus, we want to hang out with you, but you know, it just gets in the way. Things just get in the way. And we miss out on having the time of our lives with Jesus. So the clock is ticking. What are we doing about changing postal codes? So Jesus is passing by tonight. The rich young ruler had it all, and he, he also thought he knew it all, but he wouldn't allow himself to realize and admit he was in need of a savior. We have Zacchaeus, was very wealthy, and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, but he had a terrible track record with people, but he was wise enough to know that he was missing something. 
You know, a lot of times we don't want to be called fundamentalists because uh, if we do, because of the way some people have wrecked it with stupid, stupid actions and stupid thoughts and stupid comments, um, we don't like this word, but uh, if we were really honest, most people are fundamentalists. Why? Because if you look at the true terminology of the word, it means that they hold or stick to principles. Now, a lot of times people don't like fundamentalists because we have people who are like, you know, they're on TV and they're saying terrible things about people and, and you know, you just wish they'd just shut. I, I don't know if you ever are on TV, you watch TV sometimes and you see people who are supposedly called, you know, Christians and they have one and they start talking and, you know, they, you know, they go a little turn or burn or, you know, God hates this person and, you know, and you, you, just, you know, duct tape is made for a lot of uses and I love to get some duct tape sometimes and tape some mouths up and just go, shut up. You're making us look bad. But the reality of it is, is that from atheists to agnostics to abortionists to those who have a, choose alternative lifestyles, economists, politicians, most, most people are fundamentalists in thought and in position. So I ask you tonight, there's only one who ever died for your mess, my mess, your life, my life, your heartache, my heartache, your pain, my pain, your stubbornness, my stubbornness, your feelings, all to give us new life. I'd say that I would rather be fundamentalist in thought when I would get life instead of the death life I was leading. Because of Jesus, you and I were dying for. And so when I think of my position, call me whatever you want to call me, but I'm holding my position. Call me whatever you want to call me. Tell me that, like, you know, oh, you're rigid. Hey, I would much rather have a thought progression change because it's a Jesus thought progression change. I would much rather know the why I live my life, and I would much rather not live in fear, but I would know that I want the breath of God to blow through me continually, daily, so that I can be different. I want to show you this video. It's called Someone We're Dying For, and then we're going to close. The clock is ticking. What's... Your answer, my answer today. You might be the wife waiting up at night. You might be the man struggling to provide. Feeling like it's hopeless. Maybe you're the son who chose a broken road Maybe you're the girl thinking you'll end up alone Praying, God, can you hear me? Oh, God, are you listening?
Can't you see or something?